There was a spirit in the people who were building the American Midwest in the 1870s and 80s. I was never born a coward and learned in my early childhood to attend to my own affairs and never bother other people's business, but always do good by everybody, and God would love me. Mary Perrin Armstrong. On November 6, 1878, Mary Perrin married a suitor who was deeply in love with her, Joseph Armstrong of Carrollton, Illinois. The couple left immediately for Iowa, looking forward to a life of growing prosperity on the frontier. Within 10 years, their lives would be utterly changed from what they expected at that moment. After settling his father's estate involving thousands of acres of land holdings, Joseph and his wife moved to Irving, Kansas. Joseph launched into a career of business development, real estate, lumber and building materials, raising thoroughbred stock, erecting an opera house, and finally founding a bank, the Armstrong Bank. He was a success at everything. Mary recalled his ambition at that time. To be a banker had been his one ambition, and after he obtained his desire, money-making became a fixed fact for him. He saw the possibilities of making millions of dollars for himself. But Joseph's successes were clouded by his wife's failing health. She had sought help from doctors in other cities. Their family physician told them Mary's case was hopeless unless a higher power healed her. Joseph worried for the wife he loved and the young mother worried for the future of her two sons. By 1886, their once golden future looked dark. Then, Mary received another blow, word that her beloved mother had died. Mary wrote to an end, pouring out her grief for her mother and despair over her own illness. Her aunt's reply would change everything. I received word from an aunt that her daughter, who had been an invalid for 15 years, had been healed by Christian science. And I began to take courage that I could be healed. My husband, after reading the letter, urged that I go and visit my aunt and find out about Christian science. While at my aunt's, I took Christian science treatment of the practitioner in the town and was healed the third treatment. Joseph had expected that his wife would be, at best, a little improved. When she wrote him she was well, he was astonished. She sent him science and health. He read it, but said he didn't understand it. When his wife returned, she was accompanied by a new practitioner, Fanny Wilkins of Beatrice, Nebraska. Fanny had been a bedridden invalid for some 13 years until she was healed through the work of Jenny Fenn of Omaha. Fanny was on her way back to her home in Beatrice having just finished a Christian science class at Knoxville, Illinois. Her teacher was Janet Coleman. The Armstrongs listened to Mrs. Wilkins' explanations, studied the textbook, and tried to apply what they were learning. They soon felt the need for instruction, and a few months later, they were in one of Janet Coleman's classes. Then, in November 1887, the Armstrongs went to Boston for primary class with Mrs. Eddy, returning two years later for the normal class. Soon after completing the normal class, my husband and I gave our entire time to the cause of Christian science. Our work for the cause in healing the sick and preaching the gospel in the West was fought against on all sides. Still, we pressed on, healing our quota. One time, while passing through Salina, Kansas, Joseph was locked up six weeks in the pest house for smallpox, maliciously, according to his wife. While confined there, he healed four cases of smallpox and forced his release by his manifest evidence of perfect health, coming out untouched by the belief after undergoing a rigid examination by several doctors. He was successful as a practitioner and teacher, having taught a goodly number of students and having healed a large number of patients. Our demonstrations over the seeming ills of the flesh and material difficulties have been truly wonderful. The man who had wanted to make millions now only wanted to make people whole and bring the new religion into their lives.
In 1886, when the Armstrong Bank opened with a good deal of fanfare, special notice was made of one of the bank's employees. Jay Armstrong moved into his new bank building Wednesday and the handsome cashier, James Neal, has a smile for everyone. Armstrong's personable cashier, 20-year-old James Neal, rented a room in his employer's home. Later that year, when Mary Armstrong returned to Irving, fully healed, accompanied by Fanny Wilkins, Neal joined the Armstrongs for an evening of discussion with her. Mrs. Wilkins handed Neal a Christian science journal as he was going to his room. He spent several hours reading it. The next morning, his mind was made up. He ordered 12 copies of Science and Health for himself and his family and friends. But even before the books arrived, Neil leaped into testing what he was learning. I learned enough from talking with the practitioner and reading a single copy of the journal to undertake a case of healing and healed a brother of Mr. Armstrong who was in a good deal of distress and suffering, James Neal. Later, after the Armstrong's class with Mrs. Eddy, they passed along what they had learned to Joseph's star employee. Before the lessons were done, Neil announced he would resign from the bank to enter the Christian science practice. He told them he just couldn't keep out of it. In 1888, he set out on his new career, blazing a trail of healings wherever he went. In Arkansas City, Kansas, a man who had been totally deaf in one ear for many years had his hearing restored. In Salina, Kansas, a doctor's son who had been totally blind for over two years, given up as untreatable, found his sight restored. Neil recalled. In 12 weeks, he went out with some young men on the prairie hunting prairie chickens and had the best score for shooting of anyone in the party. A sheep drover came in from Russell, Kansas, 150 miles away, so lame for over a year that he could hardly stand without support. He was so completely healed that in a short time, he went home and wrote back telling me how easy it was to get on his horse and ride all day. The sheep drover put Neil in touch with a farmer's wife in Russell who had suffered injuries in childbirth. She had been bedridden seven years and the family was destitute. Neil treated the woman's case through messages sent by mail pouch. A few weeks later, the woman reported that she had felt something snap inside her. She had immediately gotten up and dressed and soon joined in the chores of the farm. After that healing, other patients in Russell began writing to Neil. He took up the case of a woman diagnosed by doctors as having a hopeless cancer. When the problem did not appear to be yielding to absent treatment, Neil boarded a train for Russell to go see her. While he was there, the bedridden woman recovered and walked the half mile to his hotel 20 or more times. She and her husband went on to work on a large ranch for a number of years. Neil ended up staying in Russell five weeks. When the woman he had corresponded with in Russell had been healed of the after effects of childbirth, Neil expected no payment from the impoverished farm couple but he gave prayerful thought to their poverty. One day, the woman's husband knocked on his hotel room door, came in, and scooped coins out of his pockets into a pile. In Neil's words, There, Mr. Neil, he said. My wife dug taters all day yesterday, and I brought them into town and sold them in order to be able to pay you something on account. Neil tried to decline, but the man insisted. In return, Neil presented him a copy of Science and Health to study. The man's fortunes improved to the point that he leased a farm outside Kansas City and sold his produce in town, going door to door. When he heard of an illness in any household, he would not rest until he saw the mistress of the house and told of his wife's healing. Neil found this plain dirt farmer a remarkable missionary. He interested more of the so-called better class of people and caused them to take up treatment than any person I had known. A year later, wanting deeper understanding, Neil sought out the Armstrong's teacher, Janet Coleman, now in Wichita. After his class with her, he set out on the trail again. Then, in Kearney, Nebraska, James faced what looked like a serious setback. 
he was charged with violating state law by treating a case without a medical license to practice healing. Undeterred, while awaiting his trial, Neal posted his sign in the lobby of the Midway Hotel and announced in the newspaper that he was staying in Kearney for six months and would be available daily to anyone who needed him. The jury acquitted him of all charges, and after the verdict, a member of the jury who had been selected for his hostility to Christian science called at the hotel to ask Neil to treat him, and also to treat his sister who lived in another town. Both were healed. So many patients came to see me while there, the chairs had to be put in the hall outside of my reception room to take care of the overflow. Neil was not alone in all this. By the end of the 1880s, hundreds of Christian science pioneers would be introducing healing through prayer into the lives of people in all corners of the United States and in many places overseas. Mrs. Eddy has pointed to the effect of such activity. Today, there is hardly a city, village, or hamlet in which are not to be found living witnesses and monuments to the virtue and power of truth as applied through this Christian system of healing disease. In 1889, with Janet Coleman's recommendation, James was admitted to the last primary class Mrs. Eddy would teach at the college in Boston. Then he returned to the Midwest. Like his colleagues spreading out to those cities, villages, and hamlets around the world, young Mr. Neal was just getting started. In 